Well, it was last week that uh, our family gathered over in central Pennsylvania to uh, witness the union, the marriage of my son Luke to uh, his new wife, Caitlin. Uh, it was really a very meaningful time of some great conversations with, with family, uh, uh, with friends, with meeting some of what will be Luke's new family, uh, his future in-laws. And it, it was certainly very meaningful. Uh, specifically, uh, Dad came up and he uh, was able to help lead in the vows and the, the presentation of the rings. And I know that was very meaningful for Luke. And, and then Luke and Caitlin asked if I could kind of share a few words uh, based on uh, the two scripture passages they had chosen out of Romans 12 as well as Ecclesiastes 4. About a cord of uh, three strands is not easily torn apart. And uh, so, you know, I've had the opportunity of, what, 26 years of ministry uh, to perform really over probably 200 uh, wedding ceremonies. But this one was a little different, you know, staring at your son, uh, kind of wondering, you know, boy, are you old enough to get married? And then reflecting, well, actually, I was that age when I got married. And uh, boy, are you have any money to get married? <laughs> and the answer was, well, no, but neither did his father. Uh, boy, are you so clueless and unprepared <laughs> that you have no idea about bringing someone else into your world? And the answer is he is clueless and he is unprepared, just like his old man was at that same point in life. And um, certainly, uh, as I had this chance to kind of uh, prepare for Luke's message, it really kind of brought back uh, some of my own journey uh, 29 years earlier as Amy and I really began to start the foundation of our home. And we called him up. He had moved into his new apartment in Greenville, uh, North Carolina. I just moved in on Wednesday. And, uh, his in-laws had brought down some of his old, old furniture and, uh, and they had some of their new wedding presents. And I looked around at this, he FaceTime, you know, the beautiful thing about technology. He could kind of hold up his phone and show me around his new digs. And I thought, you know, here's a place that's furnished with wedding presents and old furniture. And, you know, maybe that's how it should be. Uh, as he's really starting the foundation of his own kind of spiritual home. And he doesn't have to do it alone. That uh, we talked about in that Ecclesiastes passage, passage that a cord of three strands is not easily torn apart. And certainly uh, he has some of that uh, foundation of faith that's built not only within him, but uh, within uh, his new wife. And it made me think about some of the foundations I've had. Uh, that I am grateful that although maybe my parents didn't have the ability to kind of help financially build a home, they were able to provide for me that, that critical uh, foundation spiritually where you can kind of build a, a household upon. Uh, at a very early age, they opened up the stories of the Bible, uh, that chance to see that we have a God who not only creates us, but a God who cares for us. Uh, a God who cares for us so much that he sent his very essence, his son, into our world to live amongst us, to die on the cross for our sins, to offer us the power of resurrected life. All that's done to the uh, effect of Jesus Christ. And, and they help, you know, really uh, introduce me to that kind of savior. Uh, they introduced me to that idea that we have this unseen hand of God operating in our world today to both guide and to comfort us, we call the Holy Spirit, that God's power is available now, today, not just many years ago, it's available now. That, that it was uh, from my parents. I learned that there is a community of faith, that what we call a church, that is there not only to nurture this faith, but also to provide accountability for how we are to live out our daily lives. 
and that it is uh, within the uh, faith family. You learn those vital spiritual practices of prayer, as well as uh, offering yourself to a wider world, that it's not just about taking in, it's not just about being blessed, it's about being a blessing to others, of caring in mission and ministry to a wider world. That was really instilled very deeply uh, in those growing up years. And, and then that foundationally, that a faith foundation is that it's more than just a religion of rules of what to do and what not to do, that essentially what this life of faith about is a relationship with a living God who wants to sustain your life in the here and in the now. And, and so as I was preparing uh, for Luke's wedding as he's starting his own household, I kind of reflected on those things that were so important uh, for our, Amy and I as we began our household to have that foundation. But I am keenly aware, keenly aware, that for many in our society, in our world today, that there's a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, a lot of brokenness in how they were raised. Maybe they didn't have parents or grandparents who instilled within them those kind of critical values that maybe love was something that was lacking. Perhaps that sense of forgiveness uh, was really not there. And as a result, uh, there are many in our world who've grown up very cynical, uh, really finding that uh, faith is something that has no relevance in their life that the Bible is untrue, that they called out to God for help and they didn't get the answers they wanted, and that it, therefore it, it meant nothing for them. I, I know many people that think church is just outright boring, has no significance for them. A and certainly that is the world by which we live, that the fastest growing religious identification uh, in America is what are called the nuns. And I don't mean the Catholics that wear the cool hats. Uh, I mean the people that have no affiliation with any kind of faith community at all. And so subsequently, uh, they find that their community, that their uh, source of support often comes through things that I think are pretty transitory whether that might be a sports affiliation. Maybe that is a, a certain club. Uh, maybe that's a, a group that really is just kind of here and there. That that becomes their primary identity. And I think subsequently, there's so much missing. When you don't have an anchor for when the storms come raging, when the floods come pouring down, as what Gary stated right out of Matthew, that they will come. And, and how are we going to build the anchor of our lives on something that is just kind of transitory and, and can easily just go away? Or are we going to find a firm foundation uh, of our lives? And, and certainly, this idea that there are many competing loyalties, many transitory things competing for our attention, th that's nothing new. I mean, as we dig into the book of Joshua, we realize that as the people of Israel come to this promised land, this land that was given to them flowing with milk and honey, that all around them there were loyalties going back to Egypt, the Egyptian gods uh, that demanded certain things of them. And they come into the land of Canaan where they were told that uh, they needed to sacrifice their children upon these uh, foreign gods. We, we know that there were other uh, idols out there that wanted you to exploit and, and show no mercy to people. That that is the world by where God's people had landed. And those are the folks that Joshua was charged by the Lord God to help direct and care for them. And so towards the end of Joshua's life, as he's seen all these competing attention to all these foreign gods, all these idols that are trying to draw away at the Israelites, he calls them together in a place called Shechem. 
Shechem is in a valley that, near the Gilgal area, and it's just to the north of Jerusalem. It's kind of in a plain area between two mountains. A and there he assembles all the leaders. And, and this is the passage of Scripture that, that I want to focus on today. This is in uh, Joshua uh, 24. I'm going to read the first couple of verses and then skip down. Uh, Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem, he summoned the elders and the heads and the judges and the officers of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, skipping down to verse 18, Now therefore, revere the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your ancestors served beyond the river and in Egypt to serve the Lord. Now, if you're unwilling to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites to whose land you are now living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. Now, you know, as you really dig into this particular passage, Joshua is saying there are a smorgasbord of things that you can choose in life of how to identify your core values. That when it comes to this primary loyalty to who is your maker, who do you wish to serve? It's not like you can pick and choose like a little bit of here and a little bit of there. Joshua says no. You got to choose a path or you're going to lose so much. Choose or lose. That's his first imperative. That, you know, there are things in life that may be both and. You can do a little bit of this and do that as well. But when it comes to this foundational identity of your spiritual life, you know, you can't choose two masters. You have to choose one. Choose this day whom you wish to serve is Joshua's first imperative. C.S. Lewis, uh, he put it this way. He goes, you know, there is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second, it is claimed by God. And then it is counterclaimed by Satan. Do you hear this tension that all of us live within? You know, who are we going to serve? You know, how are we going to identify our lives? And Joshua lays it out. If, if you you've got to choose God or you're going to lose so much that God wants to have in store for you. Not only that, he goes later on in chapter 24 and he gives them another imperative. This is down um, uh, on verse um, 23. He says, Joshua says, Now put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your hearts to the Lord your God of Israel. Um, what, what he's really trying to emphasize here is you've got to throw away all of those things that are dragging you down so that you can go the way God wants you to go. Throw away all those foreign influences. See, those Israelites, they wanted to bring in some of those influences that they learned on the land along the river with the Amorites. And they wanted to kind of go back to some of those flesh pot ideas from Egypt. They wanted to cling to it. And Joshua's saying, friends, you know, not only do you have to choose this day whom you're going to serve, but you've got to be willing to throw away all those competing identities that want to drag you down. And you know, as a pastor of a congregation, this has been my observation. That in many cases, people don't simply renounce their faith. They don't get so mad at God. They don't get so mad at church that they just like, I, I give up on God. I give up on the Bible. I it's not that. It's instead, they get so distracted. They, they find themselves being drawn to other lesser things to compete for their identity and their attention. And I get people who, you know, I see them out in the grocery store and they give me the kind of look down at the, uh, well, pastor, I haven't been around for a while and, and I haven't been in 
doing my Bible study, and I've been praying. Well, I got busy doing that, and I got busy doing this, and I got involved with this. And, you know, I often come to the conclusion that the enemy of the best can be the very good. These are not bad things that you're doing, but they have become primary. And that's, see, that's the tension, the temptation, and the tension that all of us struggle as we are building up our lives, as we are building our spiritual household. Many things are wanting to draw us away from that which is crucial and essential. Don't allow the uh, enemy of the best to be those very good things that can be a part of our lives to keep that core and essential identity of our faith in Jesus Christ. But, you know, I come here today not to kind of lay heaviness on your heart because that was not what Joshua's intent was all those many years ago. He's saying, you know, all these other religions, all these other gods, it's kind of a quid pro quo arrangement that if you scratch the gods back, then God will bless your life. That was the competing identities that is then and is now. That if you do something for me, I'm going to do something for you. The grace of Jesus Christ, the good news of our God, is that God has already done it for us. That all we have to do is really kind of be willing to follow the path that has been laid forth. It's not what we do that is critical. It's really what God has done for us. And are we just going to be willing to align ourselves in that particular identity? You know, um, Roger Miller, in his video today uh, about the Habitat House, he talked about how uh, that crucial first step in building a a godly and a secure place is to have a firm foundation. If you build your lives on sinking sand, if you don't have that anchor, then when those storms come, bad things happen. But that when we find that anchor, we can really begin to build up and have the shelter and the life that God intends for us. But what I found interesting in Roger's Roger's talk, and maybe it went by you pretty quickly. Roger noted that when we first started back in late May and started the excavation on the site uh, where Charlene's house was originally going to be, they found that there were problems in the soil, that, that, that it was not going to be a suitable location. And so after a little bit of a delay, about a three-week delay, that they found another Uh, place, not too far away from the original one. And there, the soil was good. There, they were able to construct Charlene's house. And as I was thinking about what Roger had to say, I felt, you know, there's a connection for us as well. Because the reality is, there are some of you uh, in our congregation today, maybe you didn't quite have that strong foundation of faith growing up. Maybe you had parents who you still really uh, have found a great deal of tension and struggle with. Maybe you had uh, a family dynamic where, you know, it, it became a crumbling environment. But the good news that I want to end with today is just like Charlan was able to kind of find a new site to to build in a a new foundation that that's available to all of us. That no matter where you've been, your parents are always going to be your parents. Uh, What happened in the past is always going to be a part of your identity. But the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that we can be a new creation. We can have new possibilities. In 2 Corinthians, there's this powerful passage that is uh, St. Paul. He says this, you know, if anyone belongs to Jesus Christ, hear these words, if anyone is in Christ, then there is a new creation being built within us. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled to us, to us to himself through Christ, and he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. See what's happening, friends? 
that God is building within us daily new opportunities, new creation, new foundations that we can lay, not only for our own environment, the people in our own circle, but for future generations, that we can be involved in helping set foundations of faith for others that are in need. But the, cru- the crucial question that Joshua asked all those years ago that I think is applicable for you and for me is in this world, choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my household, I will choose the Lord. Let's pray. Almighty and holy God, we give you thanks. In the midst of brokenness of life, in the midst of the pain of our daily existence, in the midst of sometimes challenging upbringings, that you offer possibilities, new hope, new foundations by which to build our spiritual homes. And it all begins when we make a decision to serve you, to make that choice, and then to throw away all the things that compete against us. Lord, fill us with your power, your mercy, and your grace. It's the name of our Savior and Lord we pray. Amen. Thank you.